So you're going to get your exercise today because I'm going to have you stand in a few minutes, seconds. So what we're going to do is, um, if you were here the first Saturday of February, uh, Derek Hubbard preached up here. And uh, he did an online texting poll where you can poll in, right? And we didn't get 100% participation. Today we're going to get 100% participation because we're going to do a public poll with everyone standing. But before you stand, because I know your legs are exhausted for standing up and worshiping the Lord, um, we're, we're going to uh, give some instructions. So once I have you stand, you're going to sit if the answer to the question that I'm going to ask you is yes, okay? But the questions that I'm going to ask you, four questions, all revolve around the context of you being a part of a church community. So today, you are sort of a part of a church community by coming together and worshiping God in corporate worship at church in a building, right? The building is not church, you're the church. But in the context of church community, if your answer is yes, I want you to have a seat. And then after we look around, then we're going to have you stand again. And then go to the second question, third question, and then fourth question, okay? So you ready to get your standing minutes in? Okay, so stand up. Stand up. Look around and pretend you're not agitated for having to stand up again during a sermon. So, again, in the context of church community, if your answer is yes, you will sit down, okay? So, have you ever felt lonely in the context of being in a church community? Sit down if you have ever felt lonely. I want you to look around at how many people just sat down, okay? You guys must go to a pretty amazing church to have never felt lonely. We'll find out what church you go to officially next time. So everyone stand up. Have you ever felt like there was no one to talk to in the context of church community? Please sit down if your answer is yes. Have you ever felt that there is no one that you could talk to? Sit down if the answer is yes. That's a little bit better. Very good. All right, stand up. Has there ever been a time, now there's a bunch of questions with this one right here, okay? It's all wrapped up. And if one of the, I kind of cheated. I said three, four questions, but there's like three in this one question. But they all revolve around the same thing. So again, if the answer is yes, you sit down. Have you ever needed help of any kind and not received help from your church community? Have you ever needed help and you did not receive help? That's sort of the first question. If your answer is yes, you can have a seat. Here's the other one, part of that. Have you ever felt that you could not ask for help for whatever reason to your church community? If your answer is yes, please sit down. Have you ever felt or have you ever known somebody who needed help and you just didn't have the time to help them? This is an embarrassing one, sort of, but I want you to be honest and transparent and knew that they needed help and you didn't help because you just didn't have the time. Please sit down. I'll sit down to that one. I've done that before. There you go. Make you all brave. All right. Stand and look around, by the way. These are people who have asked for help, didn't receive help, or couldn't ask for help, or whatever, and saw somebody that needed help and didn't, you know, get help. So, stand up again. Last question. This one's going to get you a little vulnerable. Has there ever been a burden on your heart that you felt like you couldn't share with someone else in the context of church community? Sit down if your answer is yes. Okay, look around. That is a lot of burdens in the room that was not shared. Okay, everyone have a seat. Thank you for being honest. So what does that say about what is church? This is the questions we've been asking. What 
is church? Part of answering the question of what is church is also asking the question, what is not church? And part of what church is not is you should never feel lonely in church community. Part of what church is not is you should never not have somebody that you can talk to. Part of what church is not is a place where you feel like you can't ask for help or you don't receive help or you don't help yourself because you're just worried about what people might think if you ask for help. Part of what church is not is that if you feel burdened by something, you can't share that burden because you're in fear of judgment of what someone might say because of the burden that's on your heart. Church is not a place where you live in isolation. This is why it's in the context of church community. Community togetherness should experience all of those things always. No one left out. As you can see, there's a lot of people that sat down and have experienced one of those four areas, right? See, and that needs to change. Because as we move forward in understanding what church is, this text that we're about to read is going to be one of the most challenging texts for you to live out your life in this way. Because we've read a lot of texts, and you're like, oh, that's nice. Yeah, okay, that's what church is. We're sort of doing that. This one will challenge you to a very uncomfortable space. And that's where we're at right now. We're in Acts chapter 4, and we're starting in verse 32. But understand that Acts chapter 3 and 4 are all the same story. Chapter 3, there was a guy who was 40 years old, and then Peter and John were walking up to the temple. He was begging for money. He couldn't walk. He was lame his whole life. Everyone in the town knew who he was. Peter said, I don't have any money, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do I give to you, stand up and walk in the name of Jesus. He stood up and walked. That was his platform. That was Peter and John stepped into a radical step of faith. And what did he do? They walked into the temple. They started preaching the gospel. That was all of chapter 3. In chapter 4, the chief priests and the elders were not happy with that. Because in the name of Jesus, Jesus is what made them uncomfortable. In the name of Jesus, somebody was healed, and everyone knew it. And everyone knew where the power came from. And everything that Peter said was giving credit and honor and glory to God for doing what he did to this 40-year-old man who had never walked before. And then we get into verse 32. By the way, they were thrown into jail that night. That's the first part of chapter 4. They were thrown in the jail that night, and then they were questioned, and then they were threatened, don't speak of the name Jesus anymore. Don't do it. Now go on your way, because they didn't want to punish them, because people had saw, they were chickens, these chief priests and elders, they were, they were chicken. They didn't want to do anything, because they were afraid that there would be a revolt and an uprising against them. And they were scared of losing their power because everyone saw the power of Jesus happen in this young man. And then the gospel was preached. And then we find ourselves in verse 32. And it starts off, and we're going to stay on this one tiny little sentence for a long time, for a long time, right here. It says this, all the believers were one in heart and mind. All the believers were were one heart and one mind. Hey, let's just, take, let's just take this section of the room. Okay, you guys are left out for a minute. Let's just take this section of the room. If we were in one big room, everyone here, do you think that we could accomplish being one heart, one mind? Just us, not them, just us. Is that accomplishable? Is that a word? Is that a, can we accomplish one heart, one mind, this group right here? No, no, Aaron, of course. Aaron's like, no, never. You know, you, you, have, you will not have one heart and one mind. But yet, how many people, it says all the believers, 
okay? Let's go back to Acts chapter 2. How many, how many believers were there in Acts chapter 4? Three, two, sorry, I'm just counting down. Acts chapter 2, there was 3,000 believers. Acts chapter 4, there were 5,000 believers. Acts chapter 4, 32 says all the believers, 5,000 of them, were one in heart and mind. There's three questions we have to ask. What in the world does that mean? One heart and one mind. How can that be accomplished? And what does it look like? Those are fair questions, right? What does it mean? How can it be accomplished? What does it look like? That's what we're going to try to answer today. So this is what it means. They shared the same passion and the same purpose. They were one heart, one mind. So what does this unified in heart mean? What does one in heart mean in the context of what they were experiencing right there and then? And this is what it is. The believers had a spiritual depth of substance, of concern for one another. There was a spiritual thickness in the relationships that they had and a concern that they had for one another. A selfless, Christ-centered love for one another. Let me ask you a question. Do you have that kind of a relationship right now? with somebody in the context of the church. Not the surface junk. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. How was your week? Oh, I agree with that. It was pretty good. How about you? Oh, it was good too. See you, man. There's your relationship. Do you have a relationship that it gets to the heart? Hey, how's your heart? Nelson, what's going on this week? Where are you struggling? Hey, Jason, How are you in Jesus this week? Tell me about your week. What's going on? He gives me a thumbs up. Hey, Azad, where are you struggling? Where where are you being tempted at? Where can I pray? How can I pray for you in that? Do we ever go below the surface with each other? This is this is a depth of spiritual concern that they had with each other, but went beyond that. If there was a need in the community, and as as we unpack these verses, if there is any form of a need that anyone had in this room, it was taken care of. Because there was a spiritual depth and a love and a concern that they had for one another. And out of this love came mercy and grace and compassion that was experienced together. That was the one in heart. What about one in mind? Here is the one in mind. This is what it means. God's word unified the believers. It unified the believers. Jesus' teachings unified their actions, their thoughts, their decisions, and judgments. All were unified by the principles of Jesus' teachings. They literally had the mind of God as they moved throughout the day. They literally had the heart of God as they shared the mercy and the compassion to one another. This is serious community togetherness. Wow. See, these these believers were experiencing a oneness, a unity they could not produce on their own. This is something that cannot be manufactured. This cannot be programming. It cannot be done by programming. It cannot be created by the hands of men, and it cannot happen once a week at a church service. It is a supernatural, divine movement of the Holy Spirit on God's people. It's the only way. So how is it accomplished? How is one heart and one mind? This is what it means. We talked about what it means. Now, how can this be accomplished of becoming one heart, one mind? If it can't be done on our own, if it can't be produced, if it can't be manufactured, we can't fake this type of relationship, and it's supernatural, 
and it's in a divine anointing on each individual to care for one another, how can it be accomplished? And to understand that, the how, we have to read the verses that are prior to verse 32. So we jump up to verse 23, and as you know, you know the story. I already shared the story. They got released from jail. They were threatened, and then here's how it goes, 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. They threatened us. They told us not to speak the name of Jesus. They threw us in jail. And then check out what they did. When they heard this, they raised their voices, say that word, together. In what? Prayer. They raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said. You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Lord, you are in command and authority over all things in the earth and in the heavens. We know who you are. We know what you've accomplished. They're calling on the one and only God of the universe. And verse 29 says, now, Lord, consider their threats You've heard their threats to us. Enable your servants. This is what they ask for. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. When was the last time that that prayer fell from our lips? Think about it. When was the last time, the times that you have prayer, that those words, that request fell from your lips? Lord, no matter what is around me, no matter what threats, no matter what might happen, make me bold to speak the words of God to everyone around me. Embolden me, Lord. This is not in the context for just pastors who are all preachy all the time. This is for all of us. Embolden us. And then verse 30 when was the last time we prayed this? Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders. When was the last time we called on the name of Jesus for healing and for signs and wonders? Do you think it was just for this time capsule right here? And we're just kind of done with the signs and wonders and healing? Or is this something that should stir in our hearts to say, yeah, that should be the reality of our prayers. That makes sense. And then they prayed these things in the name of our holy servant, Jesus. Look at what happens afterwards, verse 31. After they prayed, oh, this is so cool, the place where they were meeting was shaken. What in the world is that? What would that be like to experience something like that? After they prayed, there was such a holy presence, sounds like Acts chapter 2, right? That it shook the space in which they were inhabited right there. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. And what happens right after this? Verse 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind. So the result of praying together boldly, the result of praying together for radical protection, radical healing, for signs and wonders... The result was they were one in heart and mind. Is that a type of a formula, maybe? If we look at it that way? Is that something that God's trying to say, hey, trying to grab your attention? Look at the sequence of the story. This happened, then that happened. 
Same thing happened. Go, go home and read Acts chapter 2. Same exact thing happened. They were in the upper room, prayed like crazy. What did they become? They had everything in common, the Bible says. Chapter 4, they were one heart and mind. Both times was after intense prayer together as a group. They spent time in prayer together. And I just want, I, this is, this is a very clear thing I want to say here tonight, today. A little tired, sorry. There is a demonic strategy to keep us from praying with and for one another. If you don't think that's true, think of how many times you're distracted and think of all the insecurities that fill you up before you step into someone's space and talk to them about, hey, how can I be praying for you? What excuses emerge in our heart, or does it even cross our minds? There is a demonic strategy to keep us from praying for one another, because when we become one heart and one mind, the earth is shaken with God's presence. And so what are we doing to break that demonic strategy? And we're going to have a challenge here at the end for each of you to make a decision to move into an uncomfortable space. So the next question, the last question is, what does it mean? How is this accomplished? It's accomplished through prayer. And the third thing is, what does it look like? So what does this look like? So I'm glad you asked. Verse 32 says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. And this is crazy. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Now, this is not a mandate for communal living. These verses show us that we should be willing to radically sacrifice to those that are in need when the need emerges. And with great power, verse 33, this is again, what does this look like? With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. It's a common theme in the New Testament church, pointing to the resurrection power of Jesus. We just sang about it, pointing to the resurrection power of Jesus. That's the pinnacle of the gospel story. And they were doing that in boldness. So regardless of the consequences, they continued to preach. And then it finishes, And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. There was no one lacking. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them. It's crazy, right? And they brought the money from the sales, put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. This is radical generosity. It's crazy, right? So what does one being one in heart and mind look like? We're getting a glimpse of it right now. This was intense community togetherness. They had a spiritual depth of concern for one another that went beyond just, how you doing? Is there anything you need? And I'm willing to sacrifice whatever I have to make sure that you're taken care of and that you're loved and that you're supported. And then they went into this story, this story that Luke wrote down. There's a guy named Joseph. And this guy becomes pretty famous. He was called Barnabas. And he becomes a legend in the New Testament. If it wasn't for Barnabas, no one would have talked to this crazy dude called Saul that was murdering Christians. But this guy's involved in the 5,000 that are one heart, one mind. And apparently he was a man who had a, man who had a little bit of extra. And what did he do? 
His nickname was Son of Encouragement. He sold a field. He owned, brought the money, and put it at the apostles' feet. That apparently was normal. Normal. To make sure that everyone was cared for. Now understand that church was illegal in that culture at that time. You weren't supposed to do the church thing and speak the name of Jesus thing because you would be persecuted. So the context was different. The principle of caring deeply for one another is not different today. And it goes beyond just the conversation. So I want you to take a picture of this if it's up there. I have no clue if it will be up there, but there's a phrase I want you to walk away with today. It's called true community togetherness. There it is. Awesome. Alyssa, you're great. Take a picture of this with your phones. This is the only time you're allowed to take a picture in in church. I'm just messing with you. With your phones. Because I want you to memorize this. True community togetherness happens when I give and receive selfless Christ-centered love. True community togetherness happens when I give and receive selfless Christ-centered love. So here's some observations. As Christians, we have the responsibility not just to enjoy the benefits of community togetherness, but to do our part to foster it. For some, God's grace manifested itself in receiving provisions. For others, God's grace was manifested in sacrificial giving. True community togetherness happens when I give and receive selfless Christ-centered love. See, there's sometimes that people are guilty of coming to church just to receive and to take and take and take, and they give nothing in return. And maybe not even nothing in return to God. So I've I've been guilty of that. Not judgment here. No judgment. But there's some people who are guilty of that. There's also some people who are guilty and prideful. That they don't want to receive something. Because I just don't want to put anyone out. And it might be just a prideful thing. And then there's some that are stingy. And they don't, because that's part of our our sinful nature, right? Is to keep and not to be generous, to help others that might be in need. True community togetherness happens when I give and receive in selfless, Christ-centered love. See, the New Testament church is not a far-fetched ideal. It is an example of how we should live. The example is not an achievable ideal, an unachievable ideal. It is the model for all churches to follow. So just want to share a quick story. I can't remember, because I've been here for a really long time, how many years ago this was. But Phil Fong is... um, one of my youth leaders, and he was leading a group of really rough, rough kids during Sabbath school that they would not go to traditional Sabbath school. And, um, and they, were, they were really rough kids. I'm talking kids that we had to go visit in jail, kids. Um, and uh, I remember he came to me one time, and he says, hey, so we got a kid here that um, he's sleeping in his car, and um, his stepdad and him got in a big fight, and they went to blows. I mean, I'm talking, whoosh. and he got mad. He left, and he literally comes here at night in the church parking lot, and he parks his car under the big oak trees. We used to have a whole bunch of more oak trees. Because it's the only safe place he knows to park where no one's going to mess with him at night. And he's living out of his car and he's taking showers in the hose out back of the youth center. 
huh. I said, let me, let me talk to some people. And I didn't, didn't go in front of the church. I went to a group in the church that get blamed for a lot of stuff. I've been a youth pastor here at Forest Lake Church 19 years. Crazy, right? And um, how, many, how many times have, have I heard the youth did this? The youth broke this. <laughs> the youth messied up that. Lots of years of that. Let me tell you something about the youth, though. When you call them to action and faith, let me tell you about high school kids. When you call them to action and faith, they don't care about the consequences. They just step into it. Like, Whatever, let's do it. I love that. Adults, what do we do? We evaluate and process. Oh, that's just not logical. That doesn't make any sense. Kids are like, let's dive. They're ready for spiritual adventure. We don't give them enough credit for that. So I took it before kids. And I said, I didn't go into the detail of the story. I just said, hey, there's a kid in need, desperate need. And he needs your help. How can we help him? And a couple la days later, um, I got a phone call from a parent. So can I talk to you? Said, yes. And um, his parent comes at the door and, and he says, you know, my son has been working and all of his money goes on his school bill. And um, he heard about this kid. And he pulls out of his pocket this roll of, it looked like drug dealer cash. It's like this. <laughs> Big old wad of cash. And it had tens and twenties and hundreds in there. And, and just, the, I was like, what does your son do? And um, he says, well, he works at a, he works at a, um, golf course. He gets tips. And he wanted to take this money that he made for the last month and give it to this boy. And one of the reasons why this is hard for me <laughs> is because that little punk that gave me that wad of cash that he probably stole from his dad, I don't know, but it's Jordan Williams. He's one of the guys that here come here and volunteer every week. And as a high school kid, he sacrificed, gave this wad of cash. So I came and brought Phil in and I said, how can we help this kid? Several years later, this is part of, I cannot stand this part of my ministry, but I ha have to do funerals. <laughs> And I did a funeral for, for a former student. And um, I was in the lobby and I got this big bear hug. And I got picked up in the air and I started to get shaken like this. And I'm like, okay, who is that? And I turn around and it was this boy who was <laughs> living in his car homeless in a car in the church parking lot because it was the only safe place turned around and he was a police officer <laughs> he was in uniform I'm like what I said, Man, what's going on and he just gave me another hug you know what an incredible blessing to live in a community that people give generously. And it's not just generous with financial, but what about generous with your time? Generous with your talents? It's the full picture. So what does becoming one heart and mind look like? 
for not just an isolated story that happened years ago, but for something that happens every single day in this community. So I want to put out a challenge here. Before you walk out the door and your tummy's growling right now, I know, you become one heart and one mind when you pray together. And before you leave, you are not allowed to find somebody that you're sitting on the row with or sitting next to. I don't want you to pray for somebody you're comfortable praying with. I want to put some rules in this, though. I want young men and old men to be praying for men. Men praying for men, women praying for women. Because sometimes it's just weird if a dude calls a girl and says, hey, how can I pray for you? If the girl doesn't know you that well. So I want to try to make it comfortable for everybody to do this. So if you're single here, this is not your moment. Okay, this is not your moment. Now's my moment to move in. Pastor Mark gave me that. So don't do that. There will be other moments for that. We'll pray for that if you want that to happen. <laughs> but I want you to find another person. And I want you to get their phone number. And sometime in the week, I don't want you to text them a prayer. I want you to make a phone call. Old-fashioned, right? Old-fashioned. I want you to hear their voice, and I want them to hear your voice. Don't send them a text of your voice. Pray for them together. And you just ask a simple question. How can I pray for you this week? What are you struggling with? Is there anything I can be praying for with that? Which means that every single person in this room will be prayed for by a person audibly hearing the prayer. Because we can't become one heart and one mind if we're not praying together on a regular basis. And so Justin has no idea what's going to happen next Sabbath. I don't think anybody does except Pastor Juan because I just talked to him about it this next week for next week. But I had a deep impression from the Holy Spirit and I thought it was kind of crazy. I don't even know what this looks like by the way but I felt a strong urge that we need to pray together. And I know this is really uncomfortable to do as a group, but next week when you come here, and typically Pastor Juan preaches the second Sabbath of the month, there's not going to be your typical sermon. We are going to dedicate all of next Sabbath during that time the full time of the service where there will be a mixture of music and there will be a mixture of praying together. And we're going to have a season of prayer so that this place can experience true spiritual community togetherness because it's just not church if that doesn't exist. If you're just showing up taking and leaving, it's not church. And what we are challenged to do is not only answer the question, but to live out what church means. So today, before you walk out this door, you find somebody you can pray for, pray with sometime during the week. And next week, you come here ready to pray. Father God, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this challenge. Thank you for the word of God that clarifies what church is as we move with the spirit of God in each of our hearts and lives.